Well, this is the third of a series of talks that I'm doing on the idea of flying solo. If you've missed any of the other ones, you can actually catch them on the website. Um, th what I've been talking about is the idea that all of us are flying solo in our spiritual lives, and that rather than slavishly following the teachings of others, our real task is to seek that sacred wisdom that is uniquely at the centre of all of our lives, and be guided by that in the way that we live. We're all born into our own bodies that we inhabit, and we are alone in our existence. In other words, we're flying solo. No one else lives the lives that each of us individually are given. No one else has our particular experience of consciousness, and therefore we are uniquely able to make decisions based upon what we know about our lives. And more than that, because this sort of concept of all in the universe is one, um, we know that we're intimately connected to that universe through our consciousness and also are therefore a part of a universal consciousness. We conspire with the universe in the way that we live our lives. The circumstances that come to us in our lives are therefore are unique to us and they enable us to make our own unique contribution to the evolution of that consciousness by the way we res respond to those circumstances in a loving way. That's how we make that contribution. And how we work out how to respond is through the development of wisdom, which is what I've been talking about. That uh, wonderful little bit from Proverbs that says, wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it costs you all that you have, get understanding. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honour you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and present you with a crown of splendor. So wisdom is really at the center of what it is to live our lives. Our role in life is to develop the wisdom so that we can make our own unique contribution to that evolution of consciousness through responding to circumstances in a loving way. The purpose of our lives is therefore to learn how to love. And we do that through acknowledging the connection with the divine and with all consciousness that's within us and by learning from all that's available to us in what I've been talking about is the library of consciousness, that idea that everything that's ever done is contained within consciousness, almost like a library. When we're born, we're given access to that library through our consciousness. It enables us to learn languages, to be educated, as to the latest level of understanding that we are in connection with. And then throughout our lives, we both draw from that information and we give back to it. We draw from that information and we give back to it. It's a wisdom interface consciousness, really. Nothing is lost because all connections within consciousness are registered and remain as a part of this pool of knowledge. You can see it in books, in the, in the accoutrements of learning, but also it exists in every single interaction that each of us has. Every contribution that each of us make, every effect we have is registered somewhere in consciousness and remains there available for others to connect with and to learn from. All our relationships, all the work that we do on ourselves, on the meditation cushions, all of it remains in that library of consciousness that continually evolves and develops. And that is how consciousness evolves. Like that famous hundredth monkey, we learn from what others have done. And that includes the bad stuff too. It all stays within it. So we have our inner connections with the divine, our outer connections with everything that is and everything that's ever been. And while we're alive, our job 
is to contribute to that library through developing uh, the wisdom of love. The wisdom to know how to respond to whatever circumstances come our way with a love that will contribute to that evolution. Well, that's a theory anyway. That, that's the context that we're existing within. That, that's the basic idea. And today I want to talk a little bit about how we actually do that. You know, what it, how do we interface uh, with that? What it takes to be at, at the coal face and actually dig for wisdom. The starting point, obviously, is to have developed the maturity and understanding to realize our place in the game. We, we have to get, you know, all the stuff that I've been talking about to understand that theory that I've just outlined. You know, when that theory is understood and grasped, it gives us the motivation to dig for that wisdom because we know that every little bit of work that we do is going to make a difference. It'll make a difference to our own wisdom in responding to circumstances, which will in turn create greater love in the world, which will in turn help the evolution of consciousness towards the unfolding expression of perfection, the unfolding expression of perfection that exists right at the heart of the universe. And of course, the coalface of that digging for wisdom is in our hearts. It's not something that can be worked out with the smartness of our minds. Our minds lead us to the coal face, then, then the work has to be done with our hearts. We have to open our hearts so that they can receive the wisdom and then pass it to the minds. The old thing that Ram Das said, which is on your spiritual journey, you go from your spirituality being in service to your psychodynamics, to your psychodynamics being in service of your spiritual journey. To begin with, your mind wants enlightenment, so it tries to train the heart so it can get it. But soon the mind realizes that it doesn't have the capacity to work out what to do. So it gives up to the heart to develop the wisdom which it can then use in service to the greater whole. In other words, you go from your spirituality being in service to your mind to your mind being in service to your heart, to your spiritual journey. And that's really where we begin, with the mind realizing that the heart needs to lead. Thomas Merton calls this intellectual ascent. The mind gives intellectual assent to the journey of the heart. Once the mind has given intellectual assent to the heart, we can then look at the library of consciousness to see how we can develop the process. And that includes prayers, experiential guides, everything that's left to us in the tradition that we find ourselves within. And that's the purpose of the spiritual tradition, to pass on information from the library of consciousness. I mean, we have a spiritual tradition here. You know, our roots are sort of have always been within the Christian tradition. That's where we come from. But our branches receive information from all the other wisdom traditions. But we, we take knowledge from that Christian tradition and those other wisdom traditions. And they are, uh, in a sense, you know, the ways that we receive what other people have learnt in the past. To pass on information from that library of consciousness, see, a tradition enables us to benefit from the understanding that previous generations have learnt. Prayers, in my view, are not the mind beseeching some unknown source for help. Prayers, I think, are ways to train the mind to release the wisdom from the heart. You know, I've, I've said this often before, I mentioned it, you know, but when you say the Lord's Prayer, I don't believe you're praying to God, you know, for something to happen. I think what you're doing is you're, the mind is training itself 
in order to open the heart. That's what I've always thought that the Lord's Prayer's purpose was. Father of us, you acknowledge the existence of other. The one who is in the heavens tells the mind where it exists in the world. Hallowed be your nature. It's in the right position in relationship to that other. Hallowed be your nature. May your kingdom come. You giving up to that evolution of consciousness. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. May my mind conform to the great purposes that exist. You know, give us this day our bread from above that gives our whole life meaning. Show me how to, to operate. Let us not be led into temptation, but rescue us from evil. All of it is the the mind telling itself, look, this is the way it's got to be. This is how I have to behave in order to open myself up. So I think when we do say those sorts of prayers, it is the mind training the heart in order to enable itself to open. And, you know, those sorts of prayers exist in every single tradition. The prayer is there to open the heart so it can connect with that divine order and receive wisdom. Just by saying the prayers, thoughts will come, solutions to problems, answers to worries tend to come. You know, I began my uh, process um, in using the Lord's Prayer in developing my own spiritual practice. Um, and make no bones about it, the cold face exists, the actuality of that cold face is within a spiritual practice, whatever that particularly means to you. To try and do all this stuff without a spiritual practice is like trying to get into the Olympics by just turning up to the trials, never having done any training, but think you might have some talent and might you know, be able to get on with it. Without spiritual practice, you just make things up as you go along and hoping that what you're doing will be the right thing. The spiritual practice is where you dig for wisdom. It is literally a mining exercise. Not just sort of wandering around in your life, hoping you're going to pick up a nugget of wisdom here or there, but actually setting up a mine and digging for wisdom. So you have to have a practice. And if you don't have one, then I suggest you start one. And if you don't know how to start one, just give me a ring and come see me and we'll work on that together. But you've got to have a spiritual practice if you're going to do this absolutely seriously. When I start my spiritual practice, every day I invariably start in a place of fear. Some fear or other is always there, some worry about my life. And you, one shouldn't be worried about the fact you, you, when you sit down, you immediately start in fear. Because, you know, as the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's always there to begin with. We begin with fear and worry. And when we use these prayers that I've said um, that are left behind us in the Library of Conscience, it takes away that fear and puts in its place uh, an opportunity to come from love. Now, one of the prayers that I always use in my own spiritual life, and I use it here in the chapel, I'm not, not going to use it today, but is the collect for purity. Um, and that's a great prayer. Again, it's a training of the mind prayer. It's where the mind says to itself, look, hey, this is the way it's going to be. And that prays, almighty God, so again, you're acknowledging the existence of others, to whom all hearts are open. Yeah, I have my heart and it's totally open, the divine. All desires known. Yeah, you know all those thoughts of things that I, you really want. And from whom no secrets are hidden. Yes, you know all those you know, ghastliness that's inside me and, and that's there. You know, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Come and cleanse the thoughts of my heart. May I be open to, to being cleansed by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And you can hear the mind training itself that I may perfectly love you, that I may welcome everything that comes my way and worthily magnify your holy name, and I may be a representative of that to those around me. And once again, that's a prayer that I always start my spiritual practice with. And I'm training my mind to be open and to let go of all the sort of hamster wheel behavior 
that's going on in there. So that's another good prayer uh, to use. And also, you know, in other traditions, this whole idea of in the tradition, stuff being left in the library of consciousness for us to, to, to use for ourselves. Another good tradition is the idea of icons. And here's the icon that I use here. And the idea of icons is that you gaze at them and you don't think about them, but in the shape that they are and in the various bits that are there, you see through the icon into a greater reality. In other words, something is communicated not through words, but through painting. And there are lots of different things in all these traditions, you know, stories, koans, the ten oxiding pictures in Buddhism. They're all there in previous traditions for us to use to get into that, that right space of mind in order to be able to do that. And through using these things, or anything else you might find, we prepare ourselves to dig for wisdom. And it will come. We go from worrying about our lives, from looking at others and thinking, you know, why me? Why did all these ghastly things happen to me? To recognizing that we are uniquely in the right place to develop the wisdom to deal with those circumstances that come our way so we can make a contribution through our lives uh, to that evolution. So whatever the circumstances, they're particularly for us, even if we don't like where we are. I love that old story of the, uh, of the two travellers come across a farmer uh, at his gate as they walked along the road. Can you tell me the way to the great city? One of the travellers said. Sure, said the farmer, but if I was going to be going to the great city, I wouldn't want to be starting from here. And we do think in our lives, you know, although I want all this spiritual stuff, why do I have to start from here, little old me? And the fact of that is many of us feel that way about our lives. We think that we have to get somewhere to be able to start, to be in the right place wherever that might be. But you are always in exactly the right place to be able to take the next step. You're always in exactly the right place to be able to to the next step. And it's an amazing realisation that you are right now in exactly the right place to take the next step on your spiritual journey. As I said many times before, your whole life has brought you to this point now, to hear these words, everything you've ever done has brought you to the point of being here and everything has conspired for you to be in exactly the right place. You couldn't be in a better place to take this on. And that is true of every single moment of your life. You're never in the wrong place. All you can do is not recognize that you're in the right place and then automatically You miss the point and the opportunity of the moment. To be in the right place at the right time, you simply have to acknowledge the rightness of the moment. And then, and thus, the moment becomes yours to take the next step. These prayers and all these stuff in the traditions bring us to that point. And then, once we're at that point, then the work can begin. And the real digging comes with meditation. That's where the mind gives up to the heart completely, where all our attention is put on our breath or the mantra or whatever we use as our point of focus. It could be the mountains, it could be anything where suddenly our mind is put into our hearts. The point of focus is really, when we use that point of focus, It is the small flame that we blow on to ignite the heart. When we focus on our breath or the flame or the mantra, it is the small flame that we focus on to burst the heart into flame. And to go deeper, to dig deeper, we need both the preparation of those prayers of whatever tradition that you have and the deep focus on the heart. The prayers will throw up wisdom. Often when we sit in prayers, like the Lord's Prayer or the Colic for Purity, you know, I find I come up with answers to problems 
I discover nuggets by using those words. I'll come out and say to her, I know what to do with this situation because it's come to me in the meditation. She said, really? I said, yes. And then I'll you know, explain. But even that is just what I would call panning for wisdom. You know, it's like panning for gold in a stream. You know, you pick them up as, the, as life goes on. Um, yes, it's more organized than wandering around looking for nuggets in the road. But deep mining needs meditation. It needs the heart uh, to take over and the mind to get out of the way. You have to give up to the machinery of the heart. And meditation is the development of the machinery of the heart. When we meditate, we develop the heart's capacity to be. The heart grows by us just being with it, by being with the breath, by being with the flame, by being with the mantra. We are being with the heart rather than the mind. The attention we put on the heart grows it. And like any muscle, when it grows, it becomes easier to use and access. Growing the heart in meditation means that when we're not in meditation, but out and about in our lives, the heart is with us and available to us, and it gives us the wisdom that we need in order to respond to whatever comes our way. That's the purpose of meditation in this context, to grow the heart so that it can be used to generate wisdom in daily life. And I know no other way of doing it whether you meditate on mountain walks or on a cushion or by reading scripture, lecture, divina, the intentional decision to be in the heart rather than the mind is what it takes to grow the heart and have it become the organ of wisdom that it was always meant to be. That's what all the great sages want to pass on to us. But you know, no one can do that for us. We all have to individually do that ourselves. You can't expect the good works of Jesus or the Buddha to save us. Their hours spent in meditation won't do it for you. And you know, you can't buy it either. There's no meditation offsetting. You know, Lynette, uh, pay me a certain amount of money and I'll do all the meditation for her. And she'll get the wisdom. No, you can't do that. You can't get others to do it for you. You just have to do it yourself because it's your life and it will take your wisdom to solve the problems that come your way. So the digging deep comes first from the prayer to train the mind and then with meditation to grow the heart. And when we do this, we develop the capacity for wisdom that we need to live a full life. It's the capacity for wisdom that we're developing. Capacity from the Latin capax, meaning that which can contain. So you're developing the heart's ability to contain. That's what you're doing in meditation. Our meditation develops us as vessels that can contain wisdom. And in developing that capacity, we make room for wisdom to come to us when we need it. Next week, I'm going to look at how that capacity development, how we put that into action. But having sort of burbled on for a while about this, I just think we need to just have a little bit of a go at meditation now. So I'm just going to invite you, just where you are sitting, just to maybe close your eyes. Now, I know there are a lot of people who say, oh, you know, meditation is really hard and all that sort of business. And uh, it is. It does actually, you know, as you go over the years, it does sort of tend to get easier. But I, I just want to acknowledge that, that it is hard. And there's a wonderful passage from uh, a book I really love called um, uh, The Moon in a Dew Drop by uh, Zen Master Dojin. And um, I'm going to read that to you, just, but I'm just going to point out, we do have a microphone here for anybody 
uh, in the room that wants to say anything, you can either, you can get courage up and just come and uh, you know speak a little moment if you want to uh, at the end. Uh, but uh, Master Dogen says uh, he says people of the present say you should practice what it is easy to practice. These words are quite mistaken. They are not at all in accord with the Buddha way. If this alone is what you regard as practice, then even lying down will be wearisome. If you find one thing wearisome, you will find everything wearisome. It is obvious that people who are fond of easy practice are not capable of the way. In fact, the Dharma spread and is now present in the world because of great teachers who practiced with difficulty and pain for immeasurable eons and finally attained this Dharma. If the original source is like this, how could the later streams be easy? Students who would like to study the way must not wish for easy practice. If you seek easy practice, you will certainly never reach the ground of truth or dig down to the place of treasure. Even teachers of old who had great capacity said that practice is difficult. You should know that the Buddha way is vast and profound. If the Buddha way were originally easy to practice, then teachers of the great capacity from olden times would not have said that practice is difficult and understanding is difficult. Compared with the people of old, those of today do not amount to even one hair of the nine cows. With their small capacity and shallow knowledge, even if people of today strive diligently and regard this as difficult and excellent practice, still it doesn't amount to even the easiest and easiest practice and understanding of the teachers of old. And this next bit is the good bit for us. Being old and decrepit does not exclude you. Being quite young or in your prime doesn't exclude you either. Although a master first studied when he was over 60, he became a man of excellence in his ancient lineage. The master daughter had already studied a long time by the time she was 13, and she was outstanding in the monastery. The power of Buddha Dharma is revealed depending on whether or not there is effort and is distinguished depending on whether or not it is practiced. So you've just got to go for it. If you, you, wisdom is the most precious thing. And you might think, you know, money is the most precious thing, whatever it is. But even with money, you've got to work hard to get it. And if you're aiming at wisdom, which I think, you know, what my life is, so if you're aiming at wisdom, it can be difficult and it is worth going through that. Would anyone like to say anything at all? No is an okay answer. Yes, Catherine, how nice to have you with us. It's so nice to be here. Uh, for me, it's been a lot of starts and stops. Yeah. And it takes a lot of discipline. And I was thinking at the beginning of the service when you were talking about flying solo. And the Aspen Chapel gives me so many thermal lifts. <laughs> yes. To keep the discipline going. But it's still a lot of starts and stops. So I have to keep working on the consistency. Yes, I, and I want to say a couple of things about that. I think there are two things about consistency. You know, there's that old thing which is pray as you can, not as you can't. In other words, first of all, you know, if you just can't do it for 20 minutes a day, don't. You know, if you can only do it for three minutes a day, then, and, and you can do that, just start with three minutes a day. And also, it might not be a day. I don't meditate every day. I meditate five days a week. And on Friday, I like to watch football or Homeland or something like that. And on Saturdays, I like to take two days off because that's my balance. I find a balance. If I try and do it every day, I, you know, it, it doesn't work for me at all. 
But by having that balance of knowing that work five days a week works for me is good for me because it means that I'm not forcing myself to do something I don't want to do. So I'd say even if it's one day a week, it doesn't matter. It could be one day a week, just something you can do and something you know you're going to do one day a week for three minutes on a Sunday, let's say. And then once you think, well, this is easy, you maybe go to five minutes or go to two days a week and you gradually build it up so that, you know, over the years, for me, it's like having a shower in the morning. I don't think about it. I don't think, oh, am I going to meditate? I just go, boom, you know, I just, just, I do it as part of my routine. So I think it's very important to, to be able to start so that you can continue rather than pray as you can rather than you can't. Thank you, Catherine. Anybody else?